Sakuf. He is a general secretary Nahdlatul Ulama Supreme Council and director of religious affairs by Arahma. I would like to invite Professor K. Haji uh, Yahya Khalil to come forward. <laughs> And I also would like to invite um, Professor Dr. Franz Weisen, Chair of Empirical and Practical Religious Studies, and he's also Vice Dean, Faculty of Philosophy, Theology, and Religious Studies, Radboud University. Professor Franz. And Professor Franz also will chair the discussion session and deliver uh, closing remarks after that. The floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa syukurullah wa salatu salam ala rasulullah sayyidina mulana Muhammad ibn Abdullah wa ala alihi wa sahibi mawalah Amma'abad, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished uh, scholars, uh, sisters and brothers of uh, Nadatul Ulama of Netherlands and uh, other chapters in Europe First, uh, thank you for the title that is granted to me as a professor. Also, I do not uh, teach anywhere. I think this is uh, an, an, honoris, honoris, an honoris causa, <laughs> Professor Chip, sir. Thank you again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, why are we talking about Islam wasatiyah? Why is the world sort of getting busy talking about this Islam wasatiya? It's because we all realize that we have problems with Islam. We realize that Islam is now in, our, in the context of, of our current reality is a problem. That is why we are talking about Islam wasatiya because we are seeking for a solution for this problem. Then, what is the meaning of wasatiyat? What do you have in mind when you think about wasatiyat or moderate? You know, if you talk about water, for example, water in moderate temperature means it's not too hot, not too cold. So what about Islam? Is moderate means not too Islam, but yes, Islam, but just 50% or something like that. What does that mean? Now, that's why I'm not surprised when these so-called fundamentalist, radicals, extremists then respond to this uh, idea of wasatiyat or moderate Islam with Islam kafa, mean 100% Islam. So they'll derive Islam because they're 100 and you're just less Islam than there. <laughs> because you're only 500, 50% uh, Islam. Is that the meaning of wasatiyat or moderate Islam? Well, friends, uh, it's just uh, a fact that Islam uh, has a big, big problem within the reality of our current uh, civilization, you know, what happens in the Middle East, what happens around the world, just uh, facts that prove that uh, we have a problem, big problem. Now, I just, uh, in the previous session, I some question related to you know tolerance and equality yeah. but we have 
more than more a problem than just that. If we want to stop the catastrophe that's going on in Middle East, you know, what would be the framework for that? So within Nahdat Ulama, we've been processing uh, the uh, thought in response to this kind of problem. In 2016, we um, held an international conference that Pak Jim Sosrio mentioned also in his presentation, the conference that, that we call International Summit of Moderate Islamic Leaders. You know, we use the term moderate because, you know, we have no alternative unless people will not understand, you know, what we're doing. You know. You know. Regardless, we, we agree with the term moderate or not, we're just forced to, to use it because it's already, uh, uh, you know, in the mainstream. Now, as the result of that conference, we launched a declaration. And in that declaration, we stated that the root of the problems with radicalism, extremism, and uh, terrorism is some problematic elements within the orthodoxy of Islam itself. Then we continue our effort by holding another international conference the following years in 2017. It was hosted by our young adult movement, the Krakan Pemuda Ansor. And as a result of this other conference, we launched another declaration that we call Gerakan Pemuda Ansor Declaration on Humanitarian Islam, or in Arabic, Elan Harukatis Shabab Ansor Nahdatul Ulama Anil Islam Lil Insania. What we mean is launching ideas about how Islam can be truly beneficent to all humanity. Islam that serves not only Muslims, but serve the well-being of all humanity. Because it, it is stated in Quran itself, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ I, God, uh, send you Muhammad, the Prophet وسلم, for no other purpose than as the manifestation of compassion from God to all creation. So it's rahmatan lil alamin, not just lil mu'minin, for example, or lil muslimin. So the true Islam must serve all humanity, not just Muslim. But then, when we look at the reality that we have today, we realize that we cannot materialize that ideal of having Islam that serves all humanity before we honestly uh, acknowledge problems that we have within Islam itself. Now, if we see all this uh, reality of conflicts and catastrophe, you know, everywhere, even in Indonesia, you know, we are still in a continuing struggle of, you know, gaining uh, the Islam, you know, that, uh, that we want. Indonesia is known to be a tolerant, moderate, Muslim society, but yet we still have these elements quite uh, 
powerful elements within our society who insist to have you know what so called the 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 poorest the poorer islam you know the uh, the more authentic islam which they refer to the uh, middle east model of islam or to the medieval orthodoxy of classical uh, classical orthodoxy of islam now why for example these different countries in uh, middle east are fighting each other what for why are saudis fighting against iran for example now as a result of discussion on on the reality then we concluded in our declaration that islamic world are having problems with some elements in the uh, classical orthodoxy of islam the orthodoxy that was established and you know reaching the peak uh, power within the uh, the reign of ottoman empire the reign of more than 500 years of ottoman empire as you can understand that that uh, such a long political establishment you know must served also establishment in the uh, the norms and the values and the mindset of the society now as i uh, mentioned in the previous session you know nowadays we have uh, an issue of equality between Muslim and non-Muslim. We still have, for example, uh, death penalty, you know, um, practiced in some Arab countries for apostate. Now, then, we are complaining about Islamophobia in the West. We feel like Muslims in the West are treated un unfairly, unfairly by the others in the West. So we demand uh, for uh, equal treatment you know, for Muslims in the West. You know. Now, if we think it again think again about it then how can society that sees inequality applied on their fellow people you know such in europe you have christians as majority and they they are seeing their fellow Christians in Middle East are treated unfairly. Then you demand for these Christians you know, by Muslims, you know, treated unfairly by Muslims, and then you demand for these Christians in Europe to treat Muslims in Europe fairly. You you may want you, you may argue then that not all Muslims are like the Saudis. You have different kind of Muslims in Europe, for example. You can argue that way, but you can also, you cannot also uh, ignore the the fact that many mosques in Europe are controlled by the Saudis, with Imam coming from Saudis teaching Islam's, you know, teaching Saudi Islam's <laughs> to uh, 
to Muslims in Europe. So, so now, then, this is a problem that lays in the mindset of Muslims. And this mindset is shaped by the orthodoxy, what is considered to be the uh, most authoritative standard guidance, religious guidance for Muslims. Now, if we look at the classical orthodoxy Islam, of, of Islam, then indeed there are elements within that classical orthodoxy, orthodoxy uh, that are problematic to our current reality. We have all kinds of problems there. We have problems with gender. That's why we have a special session on gender or polygamy and so forth, you know. You know, you name it, the LGBT or so forth. You know. But then if you think about the need for a more stable global order, you know, we, the, the way we see it, the uh, reality of our global, uh, you know, civilization is just going into a more and more chaotic uh, state now. So if we then, of, of course, th there are various different uh, factors, you know, causing this situation, but uh, you cannot deny that Islam has something to do with this uh, chaotic situation. We cannot assume, I mean, not that ulama cannot assume but that we know everything and we can offer solution for every problem that we have, but we know something. We know Islam. We know what is in the Islam. And we can point out what is problematic within the classical orthodoxy of Islam. So, if we think about the, the orthodoxy of Islam related to this problematic uh, situation in the world, then we point, point it out in the declaration of humanitarian Islam that I mentioned, we pointed out four centers of concern. First is the concern related to the norm about the status of non-Muslim. What is the legal status of non-Muslim? Now, in the classical orthodoxy of Islam, you can see that the, the you know, the dominating norm is enmity and segregation. In Shafi'ite uh, Madhab, for example, it is stated that the original status of non-Muslim is that their life and their properties are permissible to be taken. Al-Aslu fil kafir halalu dam wal mal except for those who are granted, you know, protection by the ruler. Illa liman dahul aman minal imam. That's the position of Shafi'at Madhab. You have different position of other Madhabs for the Maliki and Hanafi and uh, Hanbali. Because other Madhab then uh, 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 take the position that uh, uh, non-Muslims are an enemy as long as they attack, when, when they attack Muslim militarily. But this is, this is still problematic, as you can see later. You know. So now, in the past, this is normal. Because you have this Ottoman Empire reigning most of the territory inhabited by Muslims as one political system, you know, separate from the rest of the world as non-Muslim political system, such as Europe with Christianity and so forth. 
So, but now we have different reality. We have Muslim and non-Muslim living together in the same neighborhood everywhere in the world, including in Europe. You know, the significant community in, of Muslims in Europe is a new phenomenon. You, know. you, don't have, you, did, you did not have this before, for example, 1970s, right? This is new. But now you have this reality. You have, for example, in Birmingham, 20% of citizens are Muslim. It's not there before, but now you have it. You have 5% of a citizen in Paris are Muslims. And same thing also in other parts of the world. So if Muslim uh, insist to continue this mindset of enmity and segregation against non-Muslim, we have a huge problem here. Well, this kind of uh, norm is still considered to be authoritative. And even are still being taught in most of Islamic educational institutions. You know, look at Azhar. Look at our traditional pesantren of NU in Indonesia is still being taught there. That's the thing. That's one concern. Now the second concern related to the norm about political system, namely the caliphate. Because in the classical orthodoxy of Islam, the dominant norm is considered caliphate as the ultimate uh, aspiration of Muslims. Many, many, uh, you know, I think this is just logical, you know. Muslims, Islam has its own set of laws, but such set of laws, you know, can only be uh, operationalized under uh, the reign of a ruler, which is a Muslim imam. And the political system should be a caliphate. So this is still in the mindset of Muslim. I believe this is why the Saudi, you know, continues to fight against Iran, for example. It's not clear whether they want, you know, the same system like what we have in the past, we had in the past with Ottoman Empire, but I would say it's quite clear that each of them are fighting for dominant of control over the rest of Islamic world. That's why Saudi launched international campaign against the Shiite. And it, you know, it went everywhere, including in Indonesia, including in Pamakasan, so that then the, the NU people there in Pamakasan then expelled the, the whole village of Shiite out of their of their home because of this. So now what we have is the reality of national state as the base of our global international political order where each nation has its own uh, sovereignty as a state. If Muslims insist to continue this mindset of, you know, pursuing a caliphate, then all this nation state inhabited with Muslim majority should be, you know, should be demolished. demolished. That's what uh, groups like Hizbut Tahrir are articulating, this kind of idea. The third concern related to the laws itself. We know Islam has the Sharia. Sharia is the way of Islam. And it consists laws on many, many things. That's why Muslims usually uh, uh, say that Islam is a complete religion with uh, all norms and regulations about everything, you know, from 
since you wake up from your bed until you go bed again, you know, so everything, because there is Sharia. And Sharia has its own logic and its own method to, you know, uh, to produce, you know. You have the usul, you have the, uh, you know, kawaid, you have the maqasid, and so forth. You know. So it's, Sharia is a product of intellectual uh, exercise, you know, academic intellectual exercise. Now, if Muslim insist to have Sharia as the only legitimate laws, uh, you know, uh, as the base of social order, then what about the laws produced by our current modern political processes, which has a different logic, you know. In Sharia, for example, there is a norm about ijtihad and norms about mujtahid. And you know the uh, parameters uh, about uh, whether a person can be can have uh, can be considered eligible to do istihad as a mustahid. You know. This person should uh, know uh, should know and memorize all the Quran verses the hadith and so forth and so forth. You know. This person then is, if he meet the, uh, you know, prerequisites, then he is eligible to do istihad and produce laws. But what about the polit uh, modern political processes? You don't need to know anything to be a parliamentarian. You know. If people elect you, then you're uh, eligible to produce laws, <laughs> together with the uh, other members of the parliament, you know. What should Muslims, uh, you know, do about it? The fourth concern related to the existing conflicts among groups of different religion. You know, we, we have this conflict between the uh, Philippine government against the Mindanao. Okay. Mindanao Muslim, the, the Patani and the Thailand, you know, everywhere in the world, you know. So what should Muslim, the Israel and the Palestinian? So what should the uh, uh, attitude of Muslim toward this reality of conflicts? Should Muslim engage to the existing conflicts in the, in the name of helping fellow Muslim against the infidel so that Muslims should wage war against Filipina, you know, Philipp, Philippines government against the Thailand governments against Israel in the name of helping fellow Muslims? Or would we do about it? So these are our concern, that the concerns, centers of concern that we see exist within the uh, classical Islamic orthodoxy, meaning that we need, if we want uh, a more stable future for the world order, then we need to change those problematic elements within classical uh, orthodoxy of Islam. And what we need is it's not just new ideas to change this because we are dealing not just with you know, academic uh, discourse. We are dealing with the mindset of the people. That means we need an alternative, but, you know, sufficiently authoritative uh, ideas about these things. That means we need to go not just into a, an academic and intellectual debate about these problematic uh, elements, you know, to find alternative discourse, but we need to develop authority for the alternative ideas. You know. And as authority is a function of politics, meaning we need to struggle politically also. 
So that's what Nahdat Ulama has been doing throughout uh, uh, the history of its existence. For example, you know, our friend previously uh, was talking about you know, the new direction of Nahdlatul Ulama after 1983. You know. I would say it's already happening before. Shortly after the independence, 1945, you know that uh, Hatta, as vice president, launched a decree uh, that was called as Ma'lumat X, calling for the citizen to assemble political parties you know, to uh, participate in the coming general election. So then Muslim assembles this Mashumi as the sole single political party for all Muslims in Indonesia. But then, shortly before the actual general election, Natatu Lama made a decision to withdraw from Mashumi. Why? It's because the leaders of Nahdlat Ulama knew, because as a you know, prelude to, the, to what happened then, there was a, a big debate about uh, the ideology for the state. Some people want to keep Pancasila, but many people want an Islamic state. So, on, so many people there want a constitution of Islamic state. And Mashumi was, you know, the uh, vehicle for struggling for such uh, constitution of Islamic State. But leaders of Abdul Lama didn't want that because they want to change this mindset about Islamic State. They want to promote that we don't need Islamic State, that Pancasila State is enough for us. That's why they decided to withdraw from Masumi, and, and during a political, a complicated political process, you know, and it and the decree from Sukarno to just, you know, abandon the uh, parliament and declaring to go back to the original uh, 1945 constitution, and NU supported Sukarno for that. This is an illustration about how struggling for a new uh, orthodoxy is going on. So we have a more, much more complicated uh, situation if we want to talk about it in the context of global reality. But we believe that this is things we really need to do. That we would not have a clear solution for the problems that we have today related to Islam until we find a new orthodoxy, which means a new norms that would be more com compatible to the reality of, a current of our current civilization and have these new norms into the mindset of Muslims all over the world. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.